Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and welcome to Vampire Reviews, where we like things graphic. Graphic as in violent. Graphic as in bloody. Graphic as in full of pictures. You know what we haven't talked about in a while? A vampire the Masquerade. That was a joke. We talk about it now probably more than any other single franchise. Seriously, I have done very many hours of VTM content. Go watch my videos. Vampire the Masquerade from White Wolf's World of Darkness. That tabletop role-playing giant from the dark era of the early 90s that got huge in LARP circles by setting itself apart from other RPGs of the day by focusing on story and character-driven drama and intrigue more than stats and math and battles. It was a big in the nerd goth scene in the 90s and early 2000s. Really big. And ever since, it's been desperately trying its damnedest to find new ways to keep itself relevant. The 2004 PC game Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines is a cult favorite, despite how it was released unfinished and requires bootleg patches to make it playable. Many tie-in novels were published by small independent presses, but it seems many other efforts to revitalize the franchise since then haven't gone so very well. The MMO was cancelled, the revamp of the tabletop and LARP was somewhat disliked by fans, Bloodlines 2 has been in development hell for years, and at this rate, seems it will never get made. Though at least there has been a string of less ambitious computer games over the past few years, visual novels, etc. But nothing has seemed to even come close to touching the impact of the game's glory days. What? else could the franchise try to capture fresh blood? I mean, dollars. I mean, blood. Well, let's try comic books. In August of 2020, White Wolf partnered with Vault Comics to release the first issue of Vampire the Masquerade Winter's Teeth. It ran for a year with 10 issues to tell a full vampire story arc, followed by a three-issue direct sequel called Crimson Thaw that crossed the vampire story over with World of Darkness's werewolf franchise, culminating in December of last year as a lead-in to be continued in a full comic run for Werewolf the Apocalypse. Did that ever even come out? It's been eight months. But who even cares about werewolves? <laughs> we sure don't. Besides just trying to draw in fresh interest to the franchise in hopes of boosting game sales, the story in the comic included the new details of the game universe's lore that were meant to help set up and explain the updated gameplay rules and mechanics of the RPG's latest edition. They're also meant to provide a bit of a primer for the Bloodlines 2 computer game, where players will need to be familiar with all these new systems and mechanics. At least they would need to be if it ever comes out. The back matter of each comic issue features supplemental material that includes breakdowns of all these rules along with character sheets and source material unique to the setting of the Winter's Teeth story that players could incorporate into their own games if they want to play as some of these characters. And there are a lot of characters. Like every foray into Vampire the Masquerade, we've got a cast of dozens here with representatives of all the different clans, bloodlines, sects, and factions of vampires you can choose to play in the game. For someone completely unfamiliar with the franchise, it can be overwhelming and confusing trying to keep all the different types of vampires straight and all the rules and disciplines and background of the game much less character names and backstories, but the comic does its best to ease the reader into the rules of the game universe with basic definitions of a lot of key terms and concepts provided along the way. It uses the tried and true trope of starting the story with a newly sired vampire as an audience insert, learning the ropes of vampire biology and society from an expert as the story progresses. The comic does a great job of seeding out all the information through the context of the story, so that it doesn't come across as tedious to readers who are already well-versed. The story is, of course, about vampire politics, because isn't it always? Every city or region in the world where vampires live is run by a group of political leaders called the Camarilla, headed by a prince whose job it is to keep ruthless order over all local vampires to prevent humans from ever finding out vampires exist. 
this is called Maintaining the Masquerade, hence the title of the game. The usual premise of the game, and any story set in its world, is to try to live the best vampire life you can without breaking the masquerade in a way that will get the leaders to punish you. But because no two vampires in the world apparently can agree what the ideal vampire life means, they're always fighting in a constant power struggle for who should be in charge. Besides just the different clans or species of vampires with their own innate sets of values based on their literal vampire biology, there are different political factions with their varying ethical philosophies. And the latest upheaval in the game's political structure is introduced in this comic as well. Conspiracies, betrayal, and backstabbing abound. You can trust no one and cherish nothing because the one thing you can count on in this gritty, grim, dark world of darkness is losing absolutely everything you care about as the only way to win is to survive by destroying all the rest. This is the true essence of the vampire. The curse. Fun! No wonder so many people want to pretend to be a vampire playing this game. For all that emotional satisfaction. The point of the game is to identify with the vampire as opposed to other stories where the vampires are only antagonists. That doesn't mean you have to play good guys in the game, of course. You can be as bad as you want, but there has to be something in the vampire for the players to connect to. The story of the comic, written by Tim Seeley, is about one such political power struggle set in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis-St. Paul just before Christmas. Our main character here is Cecily Bain, a vampire who works for the local vampire political leaders as their grunt, taking care of the messier aspects of enforcing the masquerade, such as executing the human girlfriends of vampires who dared to let themselves do something as outrageous as fall in love. Didn't you get the memo? This is the world of darkness? No love allowed. We learn that Cecily was formerly an anarch, which means she actively rebelled against the Camarilla politics. But now she reluctantly works for the city leaders because that's the only way to get by in this horrible world. But she hates titles. She doesn't want an official title like sheriff or scourge, so they just call her their dirty boot. But because she's got such a big chip on her shoulder about it, the prince and her court don't trust her. So Cecily is pressured to accept the rare gift of being allowed to sire a new fledgling vampire as proof of her loyalty. The obvious person for Cecily to turn into a vampire is her sister, who's grown very old and sick in the decade since Cecily became eternally 18. But Cecily doesn't want to condemn her beloved sister to the sheer horrors of vampiric existence. She doesn't want to do that to anyone. Lucky for her, a completely random baby fledgling vampire just happens to turn up on her doorstep. This is the mysterious Ali Luna, who doesn't know anything about being a vampire, where she came from, or even what clan she is. And she seems to find the state of existence equally horrible. Cecily takes Ali under her wing, passing her off as her own fledgling, and begins to teach her all about just how much it sucks to be a vampire. Drinking blood is disgusting unless it comes straight from the source, but hurting people for blood, even super bad guys, comes with horrible consequences. Like this toddler who gets abandoned when Ali drinks her evil drug dealer father. Their lives get even worse when the prince gets mysteriously assassinated, and they're tasked with keeping the Twin Cities from dissolving into a bloodbath turf war between factions who want to take control. It turns out the one person they trusted on the court, Calder Went, was behind the assassination, and he frames Cecily and Ali for it, calling a blood hunt on them. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, the B-plot of the comics presents the Anarch Tales, a story following a thin-blood vampire Colleen Pendergrass and her motley group of friends who used to be the Anarch squad Cecily belonged to. Even though she's a daywalker, Colleen's life is equally shitty as she struggles with all the mundane aspects of existence, trying to keep her little found family fed and get work to keep them afloat another night while living as outcasts from both vampire and human society. The horrors of immortality juxtaposed by the despair of domesticity. This B-plot was written by Teeny and Blake Howard, and they explained that the characters of vampire that had always fascinated them are the mundane, humble, and comparatively powerless. While it was fun to read about the exploits of the big movers and shakers, what really interested them were the little questions. How does a kindred mother still take care of her mortal children? Do they have to worry about utility bills? Where is their next meal coming from? In their opinion, those made for the best game chronicles and therefore the best stories. So. 
After each issue of Winter's Teeth, we get a short Anarchs tale focusing on the really bummer life stories of each member of this coterie. The quiet moments, exploring how outcasts can come together in a world where no one else wants them. This B-plot also serves to introduce the recent changes to Thin Blood Vampire's role in the games, including the special temporary powers they can achieve through the use of blood alchemy. This, along with the game's new hunger system and the concept of the touchstone, are meant to bring readers up to speed with RPG's latest edition and get them ready for Bloodlines 2. It's, it's coming any day now. I, I can feel it. No, it's not. Back in the main plot, Cecily and Allie trace some clues to try to find evidence of their innocence and clear their name. But when Calder threatens Cecily's human sister, she convinces him to team up and scapegoat another one of the prince's flunkies instead. They've found proof that this person knew about threats against the court involving anarchs and human vampire hunters, but she was keeping it secret to try to use it for a power play later. Of course, her original plan was to use it to help the prince, not assassinate her, but Cecily doesn't like this lady anyway, so she happily throws her under the bus. No helping, only hurting in the world of darkness. Calder tells Cecily that none of his betrayal against her was personal, just business. And he was only doing it for the best of their cities because the prince had grown blind to the real problems threatening them. And really, he was just putting her out of her misery before she had the chance to even get miserable. When you're a vampire, these are the kinds of friends you have. So now, Calder wants to be the new prince. But to get the job, he has to prove that he's worthy to the Justicar of his clan, and he gets Cecily and Allie to help him for when the big boss comes to town for a visit. To prove what a ruthless and impartial prince he will be, Calder orders the death of the nurse that was taking care of Cecily's sister, but Allie refuses to stand for that. So he takes her to the ritual culling to rescue the nurse, but the dominatrix vampire in charge of the executions manipulates them into rescuing a 10-year-old kid who's a suspected vampire hunter instead. And Allie learns another harsh lesson about how brutal and horrible vampire society is when she's forced to kill the nurse herself. But turns out rescuing the kid was a mistake because he's actually part of the Mortician's Army, a militarized league of vampire hunters who have been biding their time for the Twin Cities to be weak enough to stage their attack. And with all the infighting since the prince died, now's their chance. But then it turns out that Allie was a plant from the Mortician's Army all along. Her father was the Mortician in charge of it, and he made her turn into a vampire to spy from the inside. Cecily feels betrayed, but she's hardly crushed because this is basically just another Tuesday for her in grim, dark vampire land. But she's so mad at Calder and everyone else in the court for killing her sister's nurse and, you know, all the shittiness of being a vampire in general, that she tells Allie to go ahead and call the hunters. Burn it all down! Allie makes a call, but instead of letting the hunters wipe all of the vampires out, she knocks Cecily out and puts her right in the thick of the battle so that when she wakes up, she kills most of the hunters, staging her to be the hero and primary survivor of the battle. Because you see, Allie was a double, double crosser. She's mad that her daddy cared more about vampire hunting than loving her, so she wants his army to fail but only after it takes out the rest of the prince's regime so her bestie Cecily can seize power with a clean slate, even though Cecily definitely doesn't want it. There's a big old battle, and the characters from the Anarch Tales B-plot finally join in the A-plot to help their old friend Cecily destroy the hunters and save the Twin Cities for the Camarilla to rule another night. At the end, Cecily and a few key players are all that's left, and it's up to Cecily now to take the role of prince and become that which she hated as the only means to survive. Allie is expecting to be her right-hand man, but Cecily tricks her into sharing her double-cross scheme where the others can overhear it. And then Cecily kills Allie herself by drinking her to death, which is one of the scariest and most horrible things a vampire can do to another vampire, consuming her whole soul, thereby gaining a reputation of ruthlessness so that she can rule the Twin Cities by fear, as is represented by this Pieta. I guess Allie was... Jesus, because she had to be sacrificed, but she was also the betrayer, so she's also Judas, but Cecily felt sorry for her anyway, and she was the mother figure because she was her mentor, so she's the one granting the forgiveness, but wait, I'm not sure this Pieta really knows what it's trying to say, but now Cecily is prince, and she hates it. She hates every bit of it, but it's either kill or be killed in the wild wastelands of dark and gritty Minneapolis-St. Paul, and this is her existence now. 
ruling a court of the very people who betrayed it in the first place, just waiting for her turn to be stabbed in the back next. Being a vampire is so fun! Don't you just fantasize and daydream about all this edgy nihilism being your life? To, to never have any real friends or be able to keep anything you care about and to feel utterly powerless all the time? Let's pop in our fangs and go play right now. Authors Teeny and Blake Howard said, some people are vampire fans because they love the macabre and gothic. Others enjoy the blood gore and monstrosity. Others still enjoy the dark romance inherent in the vampire genre. VTM has room for all these archetypes and more. Well, yeah, sure, the game and the stories you create in it are only as painful as you choose to make them when you play it, but this comic as a representation of it is focused on the bleakest of the bleak. Tim Seeley says, For me, the thing I loved about the VTM world was that the idea that being a vampire absolutely sucked. Here you were with immortality and power, and you were stuck in the same bullshit politics of the living world, except it was even worse. I think you'll find this is just a really gritty, twisted vampire story. It's a noir detective tale at heart, and it's about survival and morality in a world without any. Fitting for a story set in a dark, dark world of darkness. This is a good comic. It's well written. It's got a great, diverse cast of characters, especially so many complex and varied female characters. Super refreshing, considering the game's history of struggles with sexism and misogyny. So many wonderful women in here. But its story is a tragedy where nobody wins. And as an advertisement and primer for the game, I'm just saying it sure doesn't make it sound very fun to play. You may get little victories along the way, but you'll always end up losing everything that mattered in the end. A game you're ostensibly playing with your friends, but in which you can't have any friends or honest relationships. Only enemies. And the only goal is to survive to be an asshole another day. Okay, who wants to dress up and just be like absolute dicks to each other for four hours <laughs> while dealing with all the horrible mundanity of excruciating existence? Friday at 7.30? I love monsters and darkness and gothic tragedy, but... This comic seems to have forgotten that the game where you get to pretend to be a vampire is at least supposed to be kind of fun. Where is the fun? The comic hammers it in that vampires are all assholes. Life sucks and then you die and it gets worse. You can't trust any other vampires. They only care about themselves. None of us are free, slaves to the blood hunger. Anyone would do anything for it. Without constant existential threat of outside forces, vampires are turning on each other. <laughs> Even with that constant threat, they're still turning on each other. The enemy of my enemy is not my friend because no friends allowed in vampire land. No honor among monsters. No way to be a moral person. Even the arguably nicest character in the whole book tells us whether you're on the right side of history is irrelevant. It's all about survival. The world is broken. Everything we once relied upon has been torn to pieces. No friends. No allies. No one we can depend on. Death is our existence. Despair is inevitable. Everyone I know, I see only betrayal. Everywhere I look, I see only destruction. And so, as we witness these end times and watch all hope around us crumble to dust, there is only one rational reaction. Rage. Bloody, endless rage. Except it's not even the end times. It's just Tuesday. This is all times, apparently. It's a metaphor for real life. It's a political satire. Vampire politics are no different than human politics. And anyone who ever tries to live with hope or love or make the world a better place is just a naive fool who deserves to get squashed down. The contrast between this world's basic law of hopelessness that the comic insists upon and the way it presents Sicily from the start as still a good person really on the inside because we need to have a relatable protagonist to get the readers invested in the story, creates something of a disconnect. One of the new aspects of gameplay the comic introduces is the idea of the touchstone. This is a vampire's connection to the mortal world. Most touchstones are humans, but they can also be places or objects. A touchstone challenges the vampire's values and forces them to face their true nature. They are a vital part of a vampire's connection to their humanity, and vampires without a touchstone tend to succumb to the beast within more easily. 
Cecily's touchstone is her dying sister. She keeps telling us she can't make her sister a vampire because then her sister's real self would be replaced with this horrible beast. Like, she'd lose her mind and not be herself anymore. But then, Cecily says that becoming a vampire would restore her sister's memories that she's lost to dementia so she could be herself again. And how important memories are to retaining oneself. Which is it, Cecily? Would she not be herself at all, or would she be herself again? Make up your mind. Cecily's insistence on how horrible vampires are just comes off as self-loathing here that the audience isn't supposed to believe. She's not like the other vampires, or at least she doesn't have to be. She could be a good person if she would just let herself. And if she doesn't have to be, does anyone? Allie tells her that she has something none of the other vampires have. It comes out when she sees pain and suffering and innocence. She still has her human heart. But Allie has to have this too, right? In order to value this in Cecily in the first place. And when Cecily is fleeing the blood hunt, the only vampires who don't try to kill her are the outcast Nosferatu in the sewers, telling her, you have something unseen among our kind. Compassion, a trait so rare it must be protected. And since they care about this compassion, this implies that they have it too. Cecily tells us more than anything else, vampires hate other vampires because they hate themselves. So Cecily clearly isn't the lone self-loathing vampire who wishes things weren't so dark and gritty and horrible. All these other guys feel exactly the same. So why can't these vampires at least sometimes just trust each other and have good relationships? Why is it always doomed to failure. Why does morality have to be impossible in this world? Being a heartless, selfish asshole isn't something that just automatically, magically happens to you when you become a vampire, like it is in some other vampire stories. But in the game, it's a struggle against the inner beast that you are supposed to be conquering with the hunger mechanic. But then if you do, your humanity is actually a detriment. There's no room for nice people with hearts in vampire land. Only the assholes and horrible beasts survive. So, memory of your humanity is important to who you are. If you lose who you are, you become the monster. And that's why touchstones are an important game mechanic now. But we're repeatedly told being a monster is the only way to survive. Guess I'll die. Cecily does not triumph over this paradox. She isn't the exception to any rule. Her story has a tragic end. Her sister is used against her. The touchstone is a weakness, a flaw. Retaining her humanity is a flaw if she wants to survive. So why even have a touchstone at all? After her sister dies, Cecily accepts becoming the thing she hated. And she tells us, it's clear to me that it's much better to be feared than loved. But better how? Girl, you are not happy. You still hate yourself and your life. You can't trust any of these people. She's alive. She survived. I guess that's better than being dead. But as an advertisement for the RPG, is this comic telling us that survival is the only goal this game has now? And that the only way to achieve it is at the cost of losing everything you ever cared about, including your humanity? Whatever happened to playing the game for emotional satisfaction and empowerment, the development of character relationships that set this game apart from other RPGs in the first place? When you're actually playing the game, of course, it can be as fun as you want to make it. Vampires can be anything to anyone. There's room for all archetypes in VTM. It's just that you'd never know that from this comic. Which is really a shame, because otherwise it is a great book, very well done, a good writing, great art, if you happen to like your vampires tragic, heartbreaking, utterly bleak and hopeless, and they look really cool and badass while they suffer, if it was just one of many comic book stories set in this world with a variety of others, it would definitely have its place. But it's the only one. It is the one. Why did White Wolf think that this edgy nihilism was the best way to draw new players into the game, the thing to revitalize the franchise? Just what kind of fresh blood were they trying to attract with this world of assholes? I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that those are the kind of people I would want to play with. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and this was the same problem I had with the writing in Coteries of New York and Shadows of New York, which I talked all about in my Let's Play series, especially the endings. There's just no way to truly win. You end up 
feeling this utter powerlessness. To survive, you have to lose everything you cared about, lose yourself. Everything is hopeless and tragic. And yes, vampires are dark. I don't think they need to be happy, fun guys. No, they are bad guys. They're monsters, but oh no, man. As awful as the rest of the world is right now, I personally rather have my escapist fantasy have some measure of empowerment and excitement in it. Just, just a little, please. For watching my video. This video was sponsored by a special request pledge from one of my Patreon patrons, so thank that person because they brought this video to you. If there is something that you love in the world of vampires that you're like, hmm, I wonder what the maven thinks of this vampire thing I love, you can request me to read it, watch it, do it, and then review it all on my Patreon or just come to my Patreon to help support me making more of these videos. The Patreon also funds the Vampire Book Club and the Maven of the Eventide Discord server, where we all hang out and have fun and talk about vampires all day, every day. The links to all these things are in the description of this video. And while you're scrolling down there, keep scrolling and leave a comment. Tell me, algorithm building question, what clan you are when you play Vampire the Masquerade? Tell me about your characters. Tell me about your games. Tell me. If if your games are as sad and hopeless as this comic story is, or if they're completely different. You know what? I'd really like that. Show me some other sides of Vampire the Masquerade, because as, as much as I have delved into this franchise, I actually have no friends to play it with, so I never get to play it. So tell me about your games and I'll live vicariously through you. Please?